Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. The greatest battle ever fought in North America took place in 1863 over three days in July. The fighting centered in the small crossroads town of Gettysburg. Population 2,400. This crucial battle of the Civil War claimed the lives of some 6,000 Union and Confederate soldiers. When the battle was over, more people had died in Gettysburg than had ever lived there. In the years that have followed, grand monuments have been erected to honor the memory of those who lost life and limb here. But there is not a monument for everyone. Some believe that many spirits wander this place because they simply want to be remembered. Have you ever had a strange feeling while visiting the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania? Perhaps you thought you saw something, then it mysteriously vanished right before your eyes. Maybe you heard voices and sounds where no one or nothing was visible. If you have, you are not alone. Gettysburg's visitors and residents alike report a remarkable number of supernatural incidents that continue to take place here. Some say they are somehow connected to the battle that this town is famous for. I think that Gettysburg would be haunted because of so many people who died here with such a violent death so quickly. We certainly meet uh, many, many people, not, not dozens of people, but hundreds of people who, have, uh, who will report sightings to us, lots of battlefield sightings where, uh, of course, there are even phantom regiments marching and so forth. So uh, there appears to be a lot of activity. I think Gettysburg is haunted because there's probably more uh, people killed here in one spot, one small town, than in any place on the North American continent. And they're all young people who never expected to die. The Gettysburg battlefield is remembered for the ferocious fighting that took place over these serene landscapes. After the battle, these sites were named for the blood that was shed here. Places like the Valley of Death, and the rocky terrain called Devil's Den are still believed to be haunted. Two men, Jack and Robert, got a glimpse of these dark forces early on a clear, dark night in Gettysburg. The story that happened a few years ago uh, a couple of fellows took a ride on the battlefield. It was in the evening. Uh, they were anticipating maybe seeing something. Uh, it was an eerie night, and uh, it was kind of fun. The men drove slowly under the ink-black sky that hung above Warren Avenue, the road that leads to Devil's Den. As their car turned a corner, something appeared in the trees. And all of a sudden, there were seven soldiers standing there at attention. And they went by and uh, they were quite unnerved by that. They turned around real fast and came back and uh, there, was, there was nobody there. It was, the fields were clear and they couldn't have gone anywhere. The men stopped the car and watched in disbelief as the line of soldiers vanished as quickly as they had appeared. There was no rational explanation for what these men had seen, so they decided to continue on through the stillness of the night toward the battlefield. As they drove, the two thought they could hear muffled gunshots outside. They slowed their car and listened to what could only be the sound of muskets firing in the distance. Then there was the sound of cannon fire. Thinking perhaps they were missing a performance or battle reenactment, the men got out to see where the sounds were coming from. Then suddenly, uh, something big they described it as big, came crashing through the woods. Uh, it couldn't have been a deer. Uh, it couldn't have been a person. It was something 
big that was coming through the woods. They were terrified, absolutely stunned and terrified. It seemed angry and was quickly coming toward them. They ran for what they hoped would be the safety of their car. Both men were too proud to confess that they were scared. And though they mustered enough courage to carry on, both knew that strange things were occurring along the dark road that leads to Devil's Den. Slowly, their car entered the battlefield parking lot. And on that dark, chilly night, they again turned off their car. They opened a map of the battlefield and using their flashlight, tried to see where they were and what had taken place here, at this spot in Gettysburg, where so many sons and brothers had fallen in battle. While in Devil's Den, they parked their car and uh, were just sitting there talking and uh, it was dark. And one of them noticed something by the uh, passenger uh, window and uh, they had a flashlight. They shined the flashlight on it and there was this hideous goat who was, had his uh, muzzle up against the window. Uh, red eyes, they told me, they said he had red eyes. As the goats stared into the car at the men, Jack grabbed his camera from the front seat and snapped a picture. As it flashed, the goat disappeared. Later when they got the pictures developed, there was no picture, there was not even a, a flash out. The picture just didn't exist on the road. Photos that don't appear. Videos of men who were not there. Visions, voices, hauntings. Even before the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, there have been tales of strange sightings and phenomena associated with this hollowed ground. Of the most legendary places in Gettysburg, none is more mysterious than this rock. On it will be found tangible evidence of an account of haunting that predates the battle itself. A close look at the stone reveals the name P. Noel, carved in letters that are weathered and forlorn. Some locals in town contend that P. Noel was simply a battlefield maintenance worker who carved his own name in the rock for reasons only known to him many years ago. But legend strongly suggests that a young girl named Pauline Noel once answered to the name carved upon the rock. Legend has it that uh, Pauline Noel was a uh, local girl who lived there be before the turn of the century, who was a farmer's daughter, and uh, she liked to go out with her father on a wagon when he did his farm chores. Gettysburg lies in Adams County, the apple growing capital of Pennsylvania. In the 1800s, there were few roads, and farmers skillfully maneuvered their wagons across their vast fields. It was during such a ride back from their apple orchard that tragedy struck. The wagon hit a rock, and Pauline was thrown out under the wheels of the advancing wagon. Her horrified father jumped off only to find he was too late. What he saw lying on the ground was the body of his daughter, lifeless and decapitated. Since that time, it is thought that Pauline's spirit has roamed the landscape near the very rock that sent her to her death. With ghostly fingers, she burned her name into the stone as a reminder to all that she was once alive too. Many visitors report that if they trace the name Pauline Noel, a lot of uh, strange things happen to them. The few who dare run their fingers through the etched grooves at night have been witness to what can best be described as the wandering spirit of a headless girl. If this place is indeed haunted by Pauline Noel, one thing is certain, she is not alone.
A classic Gettysburg ghost story was born out of one of the most bizarre incidents of the entire Civil War. On the first day's battle, uh, July 1st, 1863, the area called Seminary Ridge was first held by Union troops, and then Confederates swept over that area and held it. Of course, Robert E. Lee was the commanding general of the Confederate Army. There were dead soldiers all over the area, and his aides, no doubt, told the other soldiers to clean this area up since the commanding general was going to use this as his headquarters. It was hot, it was July. The first thing that they did is they gathered up all the bodies and rather than burying them right there in front of Robert E. Lee, what they did is they would put them in basically cold storage. Nearby, an old barn was found that had a stone floor. They brought the bodies in. They just piled them up very quickly like cordwood uh, in this cool area so that they wouldn't decompose quite as quickly. With the great battle raging just outside the walls of the barn, the stacked bodies inside were forgotten for the moment. The rebels were now concentrating their efforts and energy on tasks for the living rather than caring for the dead. There was just one problem. A mistake had been made. The man had been wounded and was unconscious when picked up off the field. But he was decidedly not dead. Help me! He no doubt was paralyzed uh, partially. And of course, with uh, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of human flesh lying on top of him, he couldn't crawl out. He couldn't remove himself from that hideous situation. <laughs> it was the beginning of a waking nightmare. Perhaps one of the worst nightmares any human being can imagine is being buried alive. You can't move, you can't remove yourself from the situation. It's dark, you're trapped. And of course in his situation it was even worse because he had human flesh uh, that was decomposing uh, right above him. And of course you can just imagine the smells and the bodily fluids and the uh, just the sheer horror that this poor individual was experiencing as he lay underneath this pile of uh, rotting human flesh. The soldiers' cries fell on deaf ears. How could any man's voice be heard above the din of battle and the roar of cannon? Even at night, no one heard his pleas. For three days, the battle outside continued. The eyes of the world were focused on Gettysburg, but the ears were directed elsewhere, oblivious to the sound of the entombed man. And then, finally, mercifully, the fighting was over. The defeated Confederate army withdrew from the area. As in all battles, it was up to the victor to bury the dead. Triumphant Federal troops began the grim task of sorting bodies and digging graves. By this time, the young rebel had been under the body pile for five hellish days. When the Federals finally stumbled onto the pile in the barn, the soldier had almost no life left in him. He was finally discovered by Union soldiers and uh, obviously raving, perhaps uh, insane, from the uh, frustration and the anger that he felt and also the, the, the horror of the position he had been placed in, was unable to move out of. He um, died just a few days later. In the aftermath of the battle, carpenters worked overtime building caskets but it was soon apparent that the number of dead bodies in Gettysburg far exceeded the Union's ability to give all fallen soldiers a decent burial. Unmarked graves containing dozens of fallen men became the standard operating procedure of the day. In truth, only a few Confederate soldiers received proper burial at all. Perhaps because of the terrifying ordeal he had gone through in the barn, the young soldier, who had been buried alive, was now selected for such an honor. He was laid to rest in a casket just yards away from the old barn where he had spent his last terrifying hours. Therefore can I lack nothing.
know, feed me in a green pasture. The ceremony apparently didn't appease his troubled, tortured spirit. Even in death, you can imagine that he must have been very, very upset and very angry and perhaps even raging uh, after death. Maybe he's caught in that uh, uh, netherland between life and death because of this anger, this unresolved rage that he felt. Just days after he was buried, the old barn mysteriously burnt down. In its place, on the old stone foundation, a beautiful farmhouse was erected. Over the years, through each passing generation, every owner of the farmhouse reported that an angry, restless spirit dwelt in the basement of the house. It existed in a room located right where the young soldier had suffered and died. The spirit's anger and rage were so intense that it had driven many owners from the building. Even when it wasn't trying to scare people to death, it would play mind games with them. A couple moved into the house, and right from the beginning, they felt that there was something not quite right, finally culminating in uh, one night of absolute horror when uh, the door to that back room, to that little stone room, was uh, banging and moving. The couple were sound asleep. They heard what the woman described as an explosion down in the cellar. She thought perhaps the furnace had exploded. Along with the explosion, the spirit also cut the lights off. Being of strong Pennsylvania stock, the couple refused to be held prisoner in their own home by the angry ghost. They decided to go downstairs and confront it. The ghost had used this light trick before to intimidate the owners. The couple wanted an end to the nightmare, but they knew they'd have to appeal to a higher authority if they were going to rid themselves of the angry, tormented spirit. They called in a priest. And he confirmed that there was a spirit down there and that the spirit was tormented and, uh, and unhappy and angry that uh, he had been left in that uh, hideous pile drastic measures were called for. It was decided that the priest would perform an exorcism, not just to bring peace to the house, but hopefully also to the tormented soldier's soul. The exorcism is a very uh, elaborate ritual, using the cross, holy water, the text, a special text, special garments, and uh, he had a desire to uh, uh, help the spirit along, to move the spirit along out of its, its, its horrible situation that it had been in for, uh, for 13 decades. As soon as he got into the room, he detected rage and anger. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Seed this place to Christ. He wasn't really sure whether uh, he was going to be able to cleanse the house of this um, angry spirit or perhaps become a victim of it himself. The uh, cleansing took an incredible amount of energy out of the priest. Luckily, God was with the priest. His voice reached out over a century to the troubled soldier.
finally now, after all these years, the young man would mercifully be released from his burden and he could finally rest in peace. As the priest left the room, he made one last gesture. Uh, he put the sign of an exorcism, of a cleansing, on the door there. Um, and it still is there today, a, a circle with a cross inside of it. Dr. Charles Emmons of the Sociology and Anthropology Departments at the College has spent years exploring the shadowlands of the Gettysburg landscape. I think it's normal in our society not to believe in ghosts. Perhaps 12 to 20 percent believe in ghosts. And less than 10 percent probably have had a ghost experience. And if you want to be scientific about it, you should be skeptical. The only thing that bothers me is that some people just don't look at the evidence. So we have a choice between ignoring the evidence and sticking with safe, normal science, or examining the absurd and perhaps learn something that goes beyond science at this point. One building in the Gettysburg area that has spawned its share of ghost law is the Cashtown Inn. The Cashtown Inn is another one of these buildings or structures that certainly a lot of emotional energy swirled around at one time and perhaps lingers in. The inn itself was there for years and years and years before the Battle of Gettysburg, but played an important part in the campaign. The inn was built about 1800. One of the uh, earlier innkeepers here started demanding cash payment only for services. Usually people travel in those days like to either do it with uh, trade, barter, or work it off. But he'd have none of that. He used to demand cash payment. Thus the word passed up and down the turnpike when you came through this cluster of homes, you better have cash money. Therefore that's how the town got its name of Cash Town, uh, derived from that innkeeper who did demand cash payments. During the Civil War, the inn became a landmark to the Confederate Army. Few buildings anywhere in the country, including the South, that housed more Confederate generals and officers than the Cash Town Inn did, because just about all of Lee's army came past this front door, and it was easy to stop here and fill their canteens up and the troopers and come in here with the generals and officers and uh, partake of liquor and also information. Everyone from General Lee to General Hill, I'm sure uh, General Longstreet, part of Ewell's Corps, all these staff officers, brigade commanders, division commanders, all came through that front door of the inn. The Cashtown Inn had seen so much activity during the war days that I honestly do believe that there was something left behind here because all these old structures with the events that unfolded around them and the decisions that were made in these places would have to generate some sort of energy. I personally believe that there's something in the end that you really can't put your hands on, that you can't personally see. I get to feel the presence and I've had enough of people tell me stories that I can't dismiss all of them. And I do try to explain most of them away as just being an old building with a lot of drafts and a lot of cold areas and a lot of noises and a lot of creaks. But when a certain people from different parts of the country tell you enough of stories and they don't know anything about these books that's been written or different things that have been done on this here, you almost have to find truth in, in, in what's, what they're saying. Room number four at the inn has received the most attention because of reports of odd sights, sounds, and happenings by various guests. We have people come here specifically asked to stay in room number four, and uh, that's because they have an interest in spirits too. But I explained to them that the, if there is a spirit at the Cash Town Inn, that he's not confined to any particular room or space. And there's been stories told about him being seen or things happening in different parts of the inn. You can pick it up again, like some kind of radio waves or some kind of movie that was left behind. There is an attachment to the place of some kind, but we don't really know how it works. Now, it's, it's possible that it's just the spirit hanging around in that place and the energy is focused in that area. 
One phenomenon that continues to astonish proprietor Bud Buckley is the continual recurrence of a Confederate soldier in the hallways. Those who've seen him always describe exactly the same scene. The people who have said they've seen this image in this place, be it employees here over the years or people who stayed here and, and visited here, they all describe this image the same way. And that's another thing I can't explain away. I've never seen them give it a dramatic effect like with a sword or a gun or a saber drawn. And I never say, did you see this image? What did it have on? Did it have a hat? Did it have a short coat? I let the people explain to me what they saw. And so many times their description comes out almost exactly the same. And I cannot figure that out. These are evidential cases in the sense that many people report the same kind of event in the same spot where the same traumatic events occurred during the battle or throughout the hundreds of years of Gettysburg history. Over the years, two photographs taken at the inn have spawned their share of controversy and interest. Some say the inn's apparitions have been caught on film. We have a photograph here that was taken around the turn of the century. We assume that there is one person in this picture having this photograph taken, and if you look off to the left of this photograph, there's, a, there's another image there. But this gentleman's standing at attention and facing towards Gettysburg, and he much does look like he could be a, uh, a Confederate soldier with a short coat and a kepi on. And uh, in those days, to get your photograph taken, it was an event, and you would stand side by side. You would not be standing apart on the porch and standing very rigid and not even facing the camera. Some people have suggested this could be an apparition. The other photo, taken recently, has added even more mystery to the inn's ghostly reputation. So I got a photograph from uh, some people that passed by and took a picture of the inn and had sent me a copy. And in one of our windows upstairs, it's a very cl clear image of something looking out our window. It was taken on a perfectly cloudy day. And of all the photographs I've had people give me over the years, of, of supposedly images and faces in the glass, this is one I cannot s explain away because it's so real looking and the fact that there's nobody in the place. We've tried to recreate it on cloudy days. You cannot find any kind of reflection in that window that would, that would do what this particular picture did. October of 1862, General Jeb Stewart's Confederate troops raided the inn. And the following June, General A.P. Hill made the inn his headquarters prior to the famous battle. More Confederate soldiers and generals have walked on this porch than any other in the area. Some believe that they can still be seen. Here at the Cash Town, Guests report rocking chairs that rock where no one is seated. Others have the experience of hearing someone playing Dixie in the distance on a banjo. And the porch swing moves by itself when there is no wind. We had a lot of reports of that, that the swing will be swinging and all of a sudden it just comes to an abrupt stop. Eileen Hoover has been innkeeper here with her husband Dennis since 1987. In her experience, the ghosts seem to come with the job. The first week we lived here, every time I walked anywhere, I was looking over my shoulder. Um, and after about four or five days of doing that, I decided I'm not going to live here all over my shoulder. So I stood in the hallway outside the room, one, two, three, four, and I said out loud, I don't care who's here, I don't care how many of you there are, but can we make Oh. 
required to take a different route each visit. They had never had any supernatural experiences here. Attentive. 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 Attentive.
the couple slowly entered and looked around. There was no trace of the injured man or the white lady, and there was no rational explanation for what they had seen. What we call Gettysburg College uh, today was once known as Pennsylvania College. And it was much, much smaller than it is today. There were only three buildings on the Pennsylvania College campus. There was uh, Linnaean Hall. There was a building called the White House. And a very, very large edifice called Old Dorm, today called Pennsylvania Hall. The fur back there was immediately confiscated by the surgeons and used as hospitals. Every single structure was filled overflowing with the wounded uh, refuse of the battle. Old Dorm, being one of the largest structures in the area, was also filled overflowing. The lower floors they used mostly for the operating rooms, the upper floors for the recovery rooms. It's July, it's hot. Uh, the lower floors uh, soon became, became sticky with gore and, and the heat and the sweat of uh, wounded men. Amputations were a common thing, and to throw the bone out the window or bones out the window on both sides or doors or whatever, or where they carried them out in baskets or however they did it, you know, the old belief that the National Cemetery is the only place that anybody was buried during the Battle of Gettysburg, I think, is fictitious. As these people were dumping stuff, they weren't carrying them out other places and being real cautious and careful as they might be today at a hospital or something like that. I believe if they dug the areas, and I'm certainly not advocating come dig on my campus because you, you will be arrested if you do that, um, but I believe if they dug down, they'd probably run tons of artifacts, probably some bones, and it's, um, it'd probably be pretty amazing when all they'd run into because it's been there for so long. Old Dorm now is uh, the administration building for Gettysburg College. And uh, the people over there are hardworking individuals. They work sometimes late, late into the night. And um, two administrators were working late one night and uh, decided finally that they were exhausted and decided to wrap it up. So they walked down the hall together to the elevator, the same elevator they had taken hundreds of times before, uh, down to the exit on the first floor. They got in the elevator, pushed the button for the first floor, and the elevator descended three, two, one, and then continued past the first floor down to the basement. Little did they know that the elevator was taking them to a special haunting, courtesy of the ghosts of Gettysburg. Of course, they assumed that this the elevator was acting up, and so they punched the button for the first floor again. But instead of the elevator going up, it stopped at the basement. The doors opened to reveal a horrifying scene out of time and reason. Instead of the cleaned up area that they had uh, seen so many, many times before, uh, that was a storage area in the basement, the doors opened to reveal a Civil War hospital scene. Amputations going on, orderlies walking around, carrying armloads of severed limbs, surgeons working sweating in this man-made hell. Wounded soldiers writhing in the corner, waiting to be operated on. Um, other people agony in far reaches of this area. The women uh, almost panicked. They, the scene was just so unbelievable and, and incredible to them. They punched frantically at the buttons, uh, trying to punch the first floor button to get them out of this. One of the surgeons looked up from the, from the grisly task before him and beckoned to them, beseeching them to come in and help with this never-ending ordeal that he'd been going through for 120 years. And of course, to enter this scene was the last thing they wanted to do. All they wanted to do was leave. They punched frantically at the buttons again, and finally, slowly, the doors began to close, and the elevator took them back to the first floor. One of the women immediately reported the incident to campus security. Something had frightened her because she obviously, just by her emotions and her mannerisms, was scared, literally scared to death. The individual making the report was an administrator for the college, a 
person I had known prior to the incident and after the incident, always pretty level-headed, very normal. We went over and the elevator was fine, the mechanisms in the elevator was fine. There was nothing in the basement. We checked the building to make sure it wasn't a college prank. There was no indication of any kind of outside entry, anything unusual that would warrant thinking that this was somebody that had made up the story just for attention. I think people are frightened of ghosts because it's the unknown. Suddenly you're confronted with a situation you've never been in before. And uh, certainly uh, something like a, an apparition uh, that shouldn't be there or appears to be in the wrong place at the wrong time is going to frighten us. It certainly would frighten me. The Civil War hospital ghosts in the basement of Pennsylvania Hall at Gettysburg College aren't the only ghosts that have been spotted on the old campus. Since the war, each graduating class has had its share of ghost stories to tell. Asa constantly comes in and she tells us stories of things that happened to her in her house. All of the, the quads here were actually burial grounds for soldiers, so every time I walk over them, at night I think about it and I mean it just gives you an eerie feeling when you walk across campus really late sometimes. There is a persistent sighting of a sentry or a guard uh, or some call him a signalman up in the cupola of old dorm. The rumor goes that uh, Robert E. Lee used the cupola for a while as uh, a lookout post. We we're not sure whether he did or not but it certainly makes sense that he would be up there since it was the highest spot in the area. I interviewed one of the people firsthand who had the experience, and one of my students that I worked with very closely saw it himself, I believe him if he said it, and he knows of another person who did, and there was at least one other time where someone was interviewed for a paper in my class, the person saw the same thing essentially on, on the cupola. The campus theater also has a history of ghost activity. There's a story that comes from uh, Klein Theater. And the story is that there is a certain officer, a general officer dressed in a Confederate uniform, who appears on certain nights. He was seen by a couple of uh, stagehands. They were preparing the stage. There was a chair in the middle of the stage. One stagehand was up on um, a ladder. Another one had just walked onto the stage. The, the one on the ladder looked down and happened to see in the empty chair the general sitting there called to the other one as the other one turned and got a glimpse of him the general disappeared ghost sightings have been reported in many other buildings on campus <laughs> Another fabled Gettysburg ghost story emanating from the college campus occurred at Stevens Hall, which along with Pennsylvania Hall is legendary for its poltergeist activity. Stevens Hall and the Gettysburg College campus was not here at the time of the battle. It was built between 1865 and 1868. Perhaps one of the more recurrent stories of uh, Stevens Hall is what the women there who live there have called the Blue Boy. It goes back to the time, perhaps, when Stevens Hall was used as a preparatory school for Gettysburg College. And also, it may have its roots back at the time when Gettysburg had a, an orphanage on the south end of town. Apparently, there was a cruel headmistress there. Some people say that some of the women who lived in Stevens rescued a young boy from this cruel headmistress and hid him in their room over one winter here at Gettysburg. The women were confronted by a knock on the door and the headmistress of Stevens Hall when they were hiding this young man. They hustled him out onto the windowsill because it was the only place they could hide him.
when the headmistress opened the door, she searched around the room and couldn't find this young man, and then told these women that they would have to come downstairs and talk with her for a while. For about an hour, she grilled them in front of the cozy, warm fire, and of course, their thoughts kept going back to this young man. In the dead of the harsh Pennsylvania winter, the freezing young boy was forced to cling to the ledge three stories above the ground. Finally, the headmistress let them go. They bolted up the stairs, threw open the window, and couldn't find the young boy anywhere. They ran back downstairs trying to find any uh, evidence of the fact that he had fallen, and they could find nothing. There was no mark uh, in the snow below the window where he may have fallen, no footprints, nothing, no evidence at all where he may have gotten to. The mysterious disappearance of the young boy from the ledge has never been fully explained. A mystery remains and may be a ghost. For over the last 80 or 90 years, nearly every generation of women living in Stevens Hall has reported encounters with an apparition they have named the Blue Boy. mysterious are messages possibly sent from the blue boy to women presently living on the third floor of the old hall. We may never solve the blue boy riddle, but ghosts throughout history remain one of life's great mysteries. Back at Stevens Hall, the Blue Boy isn't the only unannounced visitor to the girls' dorm. There are numerous reports of the sighting of a young girl in some of the rooms who doesn't really belong there. She seems to be interested in the clothing of uh, the modern-day women who inhabit Stevens at this time. The women come back from a late-night date, open the door to their room, And they see a young girl standing there. Hey, what are you doing? The woman ran into the closet after her and could find no intruder, no young woman in the closet, and no route of escape from that closet. Another resident of Gettysburg who had a ghostly encounter was a woman who worked late at night typing papers for college professors. Her poltergeist encounter ran the full spectrum of ghostly communication. Ghosts seem to be able to communicate on not just a visual level, but uh, an auditory level, on a uh, olfactory level, uh, and a tactile level as well. So there are many different uh, manifestations of ghosts. The woman had never felt comfortable since moving into a huge old house located on Broadway. One night, she found out why. I began to have these 
feelings that something was wrong. I just didn't feel that we were alone in the house, that I felt uh, another presence there. I started feeling a sensation that uh, someone was behind me. You know how you feel when someone is standing behind you. And I turned around and nobody was there. And I thought, this is strange. Besides the feeling that something was watching her, she was also overcome by the sensation that she was sitting in the middle of a cold spot, a phenomenon that often accompanies ghost sightings. It's a chill that you cannot explain. I mean, no amount of cold weather has ever given me this type of chill. I've never had a cold from, say, snow or anything like that to chill the very core of me. And this chill does. It, it goes right through. Cold spots are very interesting. I found that all of the people who had a feeling of cold had the feeling of cold before the apparition occurred. Most people, if you ask them, would assume that you feel cold because you're scared, scared by the ghost. But in all of my cases, people got cold first and then had the apparition. Most of all, though, there lingered the feeling that she was not alone. The feeling persisted, just this overbearing feeling that something was behind me. And again, I turned around. At one point, I got up, walked out into the next room. I felt more and more ill at ease that something was there. Something was wanting me out of the family room or at least off the bottom floor, off the first floor of the house. The fear became really intense. Still, there was always the possibility that her mind was playing games with her. She had a job to do and a pressing deadline, so she decided to go back to work. Being haunted was not the first thing that came to mind when she tried to figure out what was happening. But finally, the feeling became too much. I felt that whatever it was just wanted me out of the way, so I accommodated it, and I left. I just felt that I needed to get upstairs right away. I stopped and looked back toward the library, and when I did, I saw this large column of blue light coming from the family room that I had just left. It was just long, symmetrical, glowing blue light. Well, needless to say, I didn't stay long in that spot. I mean, I don't even remember making it up the rest of the, the stairs at night. The incident profoundly scared and confused her, but not enough to drive her from the house. She's probably wondering if this is really happening and if she should give it full attention. It's a, it's a difficult thing to decide. I don't think she was necessarily entirely freaked out about the situation. She was concerned. She was upset in a particular moment. And, but she would decide to just leave, run away, go upstairs, and it would go away. I think it's... She didn't think that it was that serious that she had to leave. Within days, she returned to her nocturnal work habits. But now she also observed the light patterns made by cars passing the house believing there must be some rational reason for the mysterious blue light. I would stand late at night after I'd turn out the lights and wait for a car to come by, to turn the corner, to come down in front of the house, to see if lights from the street would cast this light in the library. Never once did I ever see a car light cast the same shadow or the same light in the room. Still, she began to experience the same sensations as before, the chilling cold spots and the intense feeling that she was not alone. Also on this night came the sounds. I started hearing sounds coming from the library of papers being rattled around. It sounded like someone was going through my husband's desk. When the noises started getting um, much worse, much louder, more intense. And when once I got up enough nerve, 
I got up and went in to check it out. Of course, nothing was there. I went back to my typing and, of course, trying to overcome the fear that I had of what I had just seen. Almost immediately, the noises in the other room started up again. She decided that was it. She wasn't going to work anymore. She started going up the stairs and paused just for a second to look around to see if maybe her eyes weren't playing tricks on her. And the blue column was there. Not only was it standing in the doorway, but as she paused, it started moving out of the doorway and towards her. It was to say she sprinted up the rest of the stairs. And this shook her up for a while because she didn't go back to her late night work for uh, several nights. Although frightening, these strange encounters were also intriguing, and they began to tap into something that Ghost may not have expected in the woman. Grit and determination. For she decided not to be run out of her own house by the apparition. I couldn't give in to it, and more than that, I wasn't going to allow anything that I couldn't see scare me from living my life the way I wanted to live. Having failed to scare her away, the ghost saved its greatest performance for the last. I had to stop and look over my shoulder again. And there in the doorway was the blue column of light. And in the column of light was the distinct features of a man. All in all, I thought he was quite handsome. He was quite dashing. But yet, at the same time, it scared the dickens out of me. He had this puzzled expression on his face, as if he was saying, why aren't you leaving? It was like, why are you still here? By showing himself, the ghost had made the game clear. This was a battle for territory. Suddenly, she knew what to do. This is my house! Get out! exorcism. I don't know how to take this exactly. It could be that she just somehow made the the spirit feel that it wasn't worth the conflict. She was arguing back. She had dealt with the trauma and it wouldn't occur to her again. There's something in me that says sometimes if you can put a face to your fear, it will help you to overcome it. There's no doubt in my mind that what I experienced in that house was something paranormal. What I experienced was real. One Gettysburg residence that is a top candidate for ghostly activity is the Kodori House. During the battle, it was in the middle of it all. Take its charge. You want to think of a focal point of the American Civil War. You may very well think that it could be the Kodori House. Situated right in the center of where Pickett's men advanced, it must be the funnel of some kind of psychic energy. How many men uh, with hopes high passed that area going towards the Union lines? And, uh, just a few minutes later, with their hopes shattered, passed wounded or suffering going back the other way. Over the years, the old house has been used as a residence for various park officials. During one haunting, it was the home of a park superintendent. 
One night, the superintendent's daughter was out there by herself. Her uh, father and mother had gone into town on one of the many social occasions superintendents are invited to. She was alone in the cellar, which had been fixed up as sort of a rec room. All of a sudden, she heard footsteps across the floor above her head. At first, she thought maybe her parents had come home, but she hadn't heard them drive in. Suddenly, she realized it wasn't her parents, so it must have been an intruder. And of course, the Kadori house is out in the middle of nowhere and far from the uh, local police or the ranger station. So she was frightened. She felt it was an intruder, and she would have to get to the phone somehow, which was on the first floor. The footsteps continued over her head, and then finally she heard the footsteps begin to go up to the second floor and realized this was perhaps her chance to go up to the telephone. She got up to the first floor, picked up the phone, called upstairs, walking all around, uh, looking, seeking something. Finally, the footsteps began coming down the stairs, so she quickly wrapped up her conversation, hung up the phone, ran back down the stairs. It seemed like an eternity while the footsteps above her head, the intruder kept wandering back and forth into the kitchen, into the dining room, back out into the uh, living room. Finally, she heard the footsteps slowly crossing the floor, approaching the uh, door to the basement, and uh, was getting more and more frightened, of course, because it was only a matter of time before he reached uh, the place where she was hiding, in essence, and the intruder would uh, come down the stairs and she would have to confront him. She was so intent on listening to the footsteps coming closer and closer and closer to the stairs to the basement where she was hiding that she apparently didn't hear the ranger vehicle drive up. Annie? Annie? It was the chief ranger bring her distress call. Of course, he had placed his rangers outside the building, which is standard procedure, and uh, they came in and uh, explained to her that no one had come out through any of the windows. Thorough search of the house showed no one in the house anywhere. And of course, she was then very confused as to just exactly what it may have been that was walking around through the Kadori house. If there's an explanation for this, it could be possibly that there are some, some spirits left over from uh, that great emotional trauma that we know as Pickett's Charge. The young are not the only ones affected by ghosts, and their sightings are not just a modern phenomena. One ghost appearance happened just years after the war and occurred to the oldest soldier to fight in the battle, Gettysburg's legendary old warrior, John Burns. John Burns was sort of a cantankerous uh, elderly gentleman, uh, uh, very active. He was constable in the town of Gettysburg at one point in his life, and he also served as an officer of the court. With the commencement of the battle on July 1st, 1863, Burns was determined to enter the fray. In retrospect, the opportunity to go to war fit his personality perfectly, for he wasn't one to back down from trouble, and he was also a super patriot. Nearly everything about him was antiquated. The rifle he carried was an out-of-date flintlock, possibly left over from the War of 1812, his clothes were equally out of style.
Although surprised by his age, federal troops accepted him and he marched into battle. As a younger man, Burns had already had some military experience, so he fell right in with the ranks, although some of the men taunted him because of his age. He gets taunted by the Union soldiers. Oh, you know, in essence, something like, oh, go home, old man, you're going to get hurt out here. Once in battle, though, he seemed to have gained the respect of the younger men. By the afternoon's end, he had received at least three and maybe more gunshot wounds from the Confederate enemy. The last shot took him out of the battle. He was carried back to his house, nursed back to health. He was written up uh, by every reporter who could taste a good story. And he did become, an, in a sense, a national sensation. But several years after the war, uh, Burns, then about 75 years old, found himself one summer evening walking along the area of the McPherson farm. He said uh, it was in the wooded area. He said as he walked through the woods, he was stopped by a Confederate soldier dressed in gray with a rifle. Now Burns was a superstitious man. He said as soon as he saw the soldier, he turned and walked out of the woods rapidly. And he said he never went back to that part of the field again. I always found that to be an interesting thought. The idea that someone who could face bullets, artillery, people trying to kill you, but yet was afraid to walk out in the woods at night. As soon as he saw something that, or thought he saw something that wasn't of this world, he said he walked away fast and wouldn't approach it. There are those, though, who will never believe a ghost story. Do you believe in ghosts yourself? No. You're not a believer at all? No. I have collected in just three years or four years approximately 130 stories of ghostly activity, sightings on the battlefield and in the, in the environs of Gettysburg. If someone says that ghosts don't exist, then they're going to have to prove that to these 130 or so individuals who've seen these things, who've actually experienced this. Virtually every major religion on the face of the earth believes in some sort of life after death, whether this life after death that the religions believe in uh, manifests itself in ghostly activity or whether it manifests itself in reincarnation or heaven certainly that points to some sort of existence after death sir do you believe in ghosts uh yes yes i do um somewhat i i think there's something out there um some other world that we don't know about yet um what it is i don't know mark nesbitt is definitely not alone in his interest with the spirit world even the Civil War residents of the White House were fascinated by it. Abraham Lincoln was involved in the spiritual world. He uh, allegedly had seances at the White House. Certainly his wife was involved, Mary Todd Lincoln, was interested in uh, the spiritual. A number of uh, residents of the White House have noticed or even sometimes complained about presences in the White House. So many of the presidents have seen spirits in, in the most famous house in America. It seems ghosts can be very territorial. One ghost in particular seems to have laid claim to the Devil's Den area of the Gettysburg National Park. One morning, a woman came in to the Park Service uh, headquarters and asked her, are there any ghosts out at Devil's Den? And of course, the official Park Service stance is not to recognize the, the other world out on the Gettysburg battlefield. The, the history and the things that really happened out there are tough enough to explain. But the ranger was interested, and so she asked the woman, why? What did you see out there? And the woman said, well, I was out there early this morning, and I kind of got turned around and lost. And so I got out of my car and walked into Devil's Den and decided I was going to take a picture. It was a pretty morning, and I needed a, 
a couple more shots on my camera. And um, she said, I had the camera up to my eye, and all of a sudden I felt a presence. What you're looking for is over there. And the woman said, I turned and went to take a picture. And when I turned around, he was gone. He just disappeared. The woman wasn't the only witness of the ghost of Devil's Den. Over the years, there have been other sightings of the scraggly apparition. And each time, he's been described as looking exactly the same, like a war-weary soldier from a long-ago Texas regiment. One of the regiments that's most associated with Devil's Den is the 1st Texas. Fought so hard, sacrificed so much to drive the Union soldiers out of Devil's Den. Many of the Texas regiments from Hood's division were described by their own contemporaries as being rather, rather rugged looking. Remember, Texas was the frontier back then. Some claim Gettysburg's Eisenhower Farm is another historic site visited by ghostly apparitions. Of course, two presidents are associated with Gettysburg, Abraham Lincoln and Dwight Eisenhower. And of course, Lincoln only stayed here one night. But Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower, decided to make this his home. When he finally purchased the farm here in Gettysburg, they realized as they were renovating that beneath everything was a, at least a 200-year-old uh, farmhouse that had been there. Various people who've worked out at the Eisenhower farm, from employees, from the Park Service to Secret Service people, have um, uh, related sounds, the auditory uh, experiences of, uh, that, are, that are unexplained. There's also the smell, an olfactory experience, the smell of, of some of the perfume, some of Mamie's favorite perfume that wafts down the hallway and down the stairway. And when they go to examine the perfume bottles, of course, no one's touched the perfume bottles. No one's opened one. None of them have spilled. An employee of the Eisenhower house described her experiences while working there alone. There is a wooden barrier at the dining room doorway that would prevent anyone from walking into that room directly yet it allows people visual access to that area. I was standing at the top of the stairs by myself and I heard somebody walk from the living room across the foyer into the dining room and it attracted my attention to the point where I followed the sound with my eyes and the sound continued through the dining room just as if the barricade wasn't there. The other thing that I experienced in the house was one evening I was in there by myself and I was on the sun porch and all of a sudden I heard a bell ringing like a handbell that was coming from the butler's pantry. There's a handbell that sits on top of a refrigerator in the butler's pantry and I picked that bell up and I rang it. The sound that I heard when I rang it even though that was the same sound, it was different. The sound that I had heard earlier was as if it was in, dare I say, in another dimension. It's like looking into a viewmaster, but I have to close. In an attempt to learn even more about the ghosts of Gettysburg, Mark Nesbitt brought noted psychic Carol Kirkpatrick to town to see if she could use her powers to look back into time at the battle and those who fought it. She indeed has a special gift. She um, has helped a number of law enforcement agencies all over the country to uh, come up with uh, leads, clues to what they have written off as unsolvable mysteries one ghost mystery they wanted to get to the bottom of was that of an apparition sighted in the home of joe and colette hood we moved in our house in september 17 years ago 
when uh, in October, I was home basically during the day. It's an old farmhouse. And when I would walk from the one room to the other, um, I would spot this image at the top of the steps going across from room to room. And um, I would look up and see her, and I think, oh, well, I didn't see that. And I'd just go on about my business. Didn't say anything to anybody for, I guess, over a year. But the ghost continued to haunt her. Finally, she told her husband. She didn't say that she was afraid of it at any time because I'd asked her that. And I did not feel afraid in the house. The house is, is a very warm feeling house, very comfortable, you know, even if there was something in there. I can't say that, that the house is a scary type of house. The Hood House is near Spangler Springs. At one time, they theorized that their ghost might be the famous woman in white. We'd heard about the lady at Spangler Springs in white and thought perhaps that the lady at Spangler Springs was the lady that this was she that lived in our house because we have handwritten deeds that go back to, to 1833 that says these uh, were owned by Spangler at one time. Hi, Carol. Carol Kirkpatrick was brought in to give her a read on the situation. She almost immediately picked up on part of the past history of the house. The Hoods already knew this part of the story and verified it. It was a, a hospital during the Civil War. I do know that the Confederates had the house the first day of the battle. Uh, the second day, the Union came in, chased them across the road, and held the house 17 days after. The psychic soon zeroed in on what might be the mystery apparition's identity. She told us that the lady that is in our home is a nurse, and she was a nun, and we figured she came from um, Emmitsburg, Maryland, because there was a nun and a priest there, and heard their presence were felt extremely in the one front room upstairs, and say, I see her go from room to room, so she would have been nursing the soldiers. Carol also revealed that the ghost was not the woman in white from Spangler Springs. In fact, the apparition seemed to resent the comparison. Carol said that the um, apparition in our house didn't like being identified as the lady in white from Spangler Springs simply because she is a nun and she would be a pure lady where the lady at uh, Spangler Springs evidently is a fallen type of woman because she must have been meeting a married man over at the Springs. Immediately after I'd found it was a nun in the house and I went back into my background, the crosses went up on the wall. That was it. I'm not taking any chances.
Please like and subscribe Horror and Channel. Author Bob Wassel collects stories of mysterious occurrences in and around the Gettysburg area. His book series entitled Haunted Gettysburg presents a compilation of the letters and reports he has received while researching these strange events. I think one of the things that uh, triggered my interest in uh, Gettysburg and the haunts of Gettysburg is the tour of the Jenny Wade House and that was very unnerving. The house has a tragic history that began on July 2nd, 1863. It was the second day of fighting. A 20-year-old woman named Jenny Wade took refuge with her mother in this house on Baltimore Street. General Abner Doubleday's Union troops were in retreat during an onslaught of Confederate artillery fire. Hungry and thirsty, the soldiers gathered outside the house. They hoped for a brief respite from the fighting. They needed food for their empty stomachs and water for their canteens. Jenny Wade dutifully obliged the men. She handed out bread that she had baked and saved little for herself and her family. By the afternoon, the bread was gone. Now she could only offer the men water. Even for this comfort, the weary soldiers were grateful. At six the next morning, Jenny Wade awoke and read a passage from the Bible. She turned to the book of Psalms. Outside, the sound of artillery fire could already be heard from the battlefield. Wait on the Lord. As the third day of battle raged outside, more Union soldiers appeared at the house looking for something to eat. Determined to help, Jenny set about baking biscuits so that they might have the strength to continue their fight. But that morning, Confederate marksmen had taken positions in the buildings on both sides of Baltimore Street. They had begun firing bullets into the surrounding area. Then the snipers turned toward the Jenny Wade house. Perhaps the rebels believed there were Union soldiers inside. At 8.30 that morning, a Louisiana infantryman in an upstairs room took aim at the door of the Wade house and fired. His bullet went through the door. Screams came from inside. The bullet struck Jenny in the back, piercing her heart. She fell to the floor as blood mixed with the dough still on her hands. Today, the Jenny Wade House is a tourist stop for most of Gettysburg's visitors. They come here hoping to get a feeling for what life was like for the civilians who lived here during that terrifying battle. But some visitors get more than a feeling from this place. They believe that the Jenny Wade House is haunted by the spirit of the brave girl who died here nearly 140 years ago. Author Bob Wassel recounts his experience there. I had gathered for a tour at the Jenny Wade House and uh, a lady came in and she looked very strange and she said she had a brochure and she said, um, this picture on the brochure is my daughter Jenny, and she said, uh, I had to come into this house. Something drew me here. The woman's name was Alice. She was visiting Gettysburg from Silver Springs, Maryland with her husband. At the sight of the picture on the Jenny Wade brochure, he was too disturbed to take the tour and had let Alice come alone. She seemed very upset. She said uh, her daughter, her own daughter, which, whose name was Jenny, died in July at the same age as Jenny Wade. Wassel followed Alice and the tour group inside, but neither was prepared for what happened next. 
As she nervously toured the house, Alice began to feel as if she was being watched. But it was a familiar presence, she felt. The presence of her daughter, Jenny. The tour had begun in the parlor room where bullet holes from the Confederate snipers could still be seen in the fireplace and the furniture. They learned that it was here that Jenny had read from her Bible early on the morning of her death, and that it was here that the Wade family had taken cover at the beginning of the Battle of Gettysburg. During this, Alice began to feel not like a tourist. Instead, she felt uneasy, as if she had been beckoned here by someone or something. The group moved on, but Alice lingered in front of the kitchen. At that moment, a strange vision appeared to Alice from behind the baking table. It was cloudy at first, but soon suggested the shape of a young woman. As the vision continued, she saw the woman more distinctly. She appeared to Alice to be making bread, just as Jenny Wade had done here in this room almost 140 years ago. Was this the spirit of Jenny Wade? A young soul locked into this scene at the moment she was killed and perpetually, dutifully, baking bread. Did her spirit never learn that the soldiers who needed food as they struggled to defend Gettysburg were all gone? Perhaps this was not a true spirit, but a faint image from a day that was so powerful, traces of it still linger here in the Jenny Wade house. What is certain is that to come to Gettysburg is to confront a past that is ever soaked with the blood of thousands upon thousands of people. Their spirits can be felt, if not directly seen here. Stop at the house where Jenny Wade died and you have only begun a journey through haunted Gettysburg. Located just inside the boundaries of the Gettysburg National Park is Spangler Springs. Clearly, this is not one of the main tour destinations for most visitors to the park. Other areas saw much more spectacular action during the battle. Please like Their main claim to fame channel. since the war is because of recurrent sightings here of a ghost that has come to be known as the Woman in White. Legend has it that she is the sad spirit of a young woman who committed suicide at the Springs many years ago after the man she was about to marry broke off the relationship. Most recently, the despondent apparition was sighted by two vacationing nurses. They had heard there were ghosts in Gettysburg, but as veterans of the nursing profession, they approached everything with a high degree of skepticism. Nursing, at least as far as what I do on one hand, is extremely organized. It's fairly scientific. You have your um, methods that you go through, um, and things usually go in steps one, two, three. I'm usually someone who needs a lot of facts. As darkness descended upon the park, they decided to tempt fate and stay after sundown. Basically, we were touring the park at night. I, li I like the wildlife. I went out to look for wildlife. We both were joking and talking about ghosts. So we had been making references to, you know, let's pull over here and look and see if, if we can find anything. This looks like a good spot. I'm gonna cut the lights. We'd been sitting there. It had only seemed like maybe a few moments. I know it was probably a little more than that. It was probably four or five minutes when I heard this popping sound. And then, an inexplicable chain of events began to unfold. Do you see that tree there? Uh-huh. I noticed on the knoll, the last tree on the right had what appeared to be like a white mist that was, was rising or coming around the tree. I, I kind of blinked a few times and I looked around and I looked back 
this mist took shape. It took shape in the, in the form of a human female. This person was all in white. I think at that point it settled in with me that, um, oh geez, this is, this is something that, that's really happening. Um, something did just appear out of thin air, um, out of the darkness of night, and things like that just don't happen. Um, so, and at that point I did turn my head. Although Jennifer looked away, Dala continued to watch, enthralled by the apparition. Neither nurse had ever heard anything about the tragic woman in white at this time, and yet the ghost seemed to communicate to them without words her tale of unbearable suicidal grief. That was when the sadness struck. Um, I remember telling Jennifer, oh, she's so beautiful. She is just so beautiful and it's so sad. And all of a sudden the tears started running down my face. You know, Darla, we need to go and, and we need to drive out of here now. By this time, Jennifer had had enough. Although Darla was completely caught up in the haunting, her friend wouldn't stay another second. The reason I, I wanted to leave was simply because something had just appeared out of nothing. And that, that is really foreign to me. After the incident, many were startled to hear such a wild tale from the two nurses. I know what I saw. I don't feel challenged by their questions. Um, it really doesn't bother me that they don't believe. I always thought that I would be so compelled to somehow make them believe what I've seen, and it's, it's really not important to me. I know what I saw, it was very vivid, and that's all I needed to know. Along with Mark Nesbitt, another longtime observer of the ghosts of Gettysburg phenomena is Dr. Charles Emmons of the Anthropology and Sociology Department's at Gettysburg College. The world of the ghost, this is a very interesting question. I'm inclined to think that they go about a fairly active kind of life, if you want to call it that, and then just part of the time, they intersect with us. So that I think we're inclined to imagine that ghosts are only active in one little period of time when we see them. But it seems more likely, more logical to me, that they're going through a lot of activity. And then just once in a while, our times or our space-time intersect. And that's when we observe them. The sighting of a ghost is an extremely rare occurrence. Most witnesses of poltergeist activity describe the experience as almost an accident. Something the ghost never intended in the first place. A lot of times they're not paying very much attention to you. They seem kind of spacey or a so-called dumb ghost, as opposed to a smart ghost, which is going to interact with you. There are so many things we'd like to know about them. Do they, uh, do they have feelings? Do they uh, enjoy themselves when we're not watching, when we, we are not tapped into their world, when we can't see them? Do they have enemies? Do they have friends? Do they love? We know probably that they have a sense of humor, at least the poltergeists or the uh, mischievous ghosts that we uh, uh, have experienced. Or maybe they don't exist at all. Maybe they're just figments of our imaginations. We know for sure one thing, and that's that they're totally unpredictable. The Lutheran Seminary of Gettysburg is one of the town's landmarks. Established long before the war, in 1826, it was well known to many of the soldiers who came to Gettysburg to fight. 
General Reynolds is said to have visited the school grounds prior to going into battle. Still vital today, the seminary attracts some of the top theological students in the country, including Roscoe Barnes III. It also has legends of ghost sightings. Prior to his own poltergeist encounter in 1992, Roscoe most definitely did not believe in ghosts. As a Christian, I have certain views about the dead and what happens uh, with the dead. I thought some people are given to that and they see what they want to see. The imagination is very powerful. And I felt that because of uh, stories circulating in the area, well, the students were seeing what they pretty much wanted to see. That was my opinion. But of course, that all changed. <laughs> During a night in February of 1992, Roscoe was going through his usual routine. The study load at the seminary is demanding, and he was up late as usual hitting the books. Please, like Finally, he decided to go to bed. In the middle of the night, he was startled awake. Please like and subscribe Horror and Channel. Sometime between two and three, I heard a friend down the hall scream. Uh, at first, I thought he was playing another one of his jokes. And because he had been in the military, I thought he was making one of his army calls. And I thought just for a second that maybe there's a problem, but again, I thought military, and I didn't think much of it. About two hours later, I was awakened by a very strange presence in the room. I was sleeping on my right side, facing the window. And I just had the feeling that someone was standing in the room looking at me. You know, sometimes you can sense those things. Given my background as a Christian and Pentecostal, I felt the presence was something evil. I immediately thought there was a demonic, satanic presence in the room. I turned my head over slightly toward the left to look at this presence. I had no idea what it was or what it looked like, but I looked over there, and when I looked, I saw what appeared to be a man who appeared to be tall. I had the feeling that he was looking through me, and I quickly turned to my right, and for a second I asked myself, so, am I dreaming? Am I awake? Is it real? And so I looked again a second time. He was in the same position, standing, looking the same way. So I turned back to the right and began to pray, asking God to help me, uh, calling on the name of Christ, pleading for his help. Because I was scared to death, it was frightening. I looked over the third time with more confident, more courage, with more hope that something uh, was going to happen. He was 
it was standing there still man, on the third time. And then I turned my head and continued to pray. Uh, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. These prayers were all uh, without any lip movement. They were all within my mind. I was afraid to move or to show much uh, motion. I didn't know what would happen. So, but in my mind, I prayed that way. And then when I turned the fourth time, he was gone. I laid it. Shaken by the experience, but fortified by his faith, Roscoe decided to let the incident pass. Several days later, however, he happened to meet his friend, the one who lived down the hallway, and who he had heard scream on the same night he had seen the ghost. Their long conversation covered many topics. Somehow we ended up on the subject um, uh, of dreams and demons. And that's when the subject came up, fear. He said, well, man, just the other night something happened to me, and it just really, it, it, it just scared the heck out of me. Evidently, at almost the same time, the apparition Roscoe had seen had also visited his friend. Unlike the officer standing in Roscoe's room, though, for this haunting, the ghost chose only to show his head floating around the room. At the time, I thought, we, we described it as a dream. But then we thought, this is too coincidental. I mean, it, it's got to be more to it than just a dream. Is the Civil War still being fought in the spirit world around Gettysburg? No one can say for sure, but there are hundreds of eyewitnesses who will tell you yes. As writer of the Ghosts of Gettysburg books, Mark Nesbitt has developed a unique perspective on his elusive subject matter. To rule out hoax, each story must go through a rigid process of authentication before being published. What I try and do is interview the people. I talk to them at least three, sometimes four times before I finally write the story down. The first time either they call me or someone refers them to me, I'll give them a call, have them tell me the story. Usually I'll call them again and uh, talk to them again and then have an eye-to-eye -eye interview with them. And uh, that sometimes yes. will uh, reveal more about the person. It's very difficult to lie to somebody when you're going face to face. Some ghosts are menacing, but most seem to be just lost, wandering souls. There's no doubt that people, uh, having seen film and, and, and TV, have this idea that ghosts are uh, malevolent and, and, and are attempting to harm someone. But this is, I don't believe this is the case. The idea that they're caught between worlds trying to work out problems, I think, is, is fairly prevalent. The ghost stories that I've collected, the ghosts appear to be just more or less stuck in this particular area. Many people even learn to live with the ghosts that inhabit their homes. A friend of mine um, who has gone on to a distinguished law career in Baltimore told me the story of how she was at a, uh, a party at a uh, one of the uh, fellows who lived in one of the apartments here in Gettysburg. The kids like to get together and, and, and have parties just like any other college town. It was a Friday night party at the home of other college students who were renting Civil War House. 
The Civil War house was designed like many other Civil War homes. The older part of the house was in the back, and at the front of the house was the living room, which had been added in the 1930s or 40s. She was in the modern section of the house, and the party was going on, and she looked through a couple of doors into the older section of the house, and she noticed a young man standing there. I was very struck by the fact that he looked sad. When I looked closer, I realized that it seemed there were tears running down his face, and it seemed as if he wanted to move forward into the rest of the house where the party was taking place, but couldn't, for some reason, was being held back. She waved to him to try and get him to uh, join the party, but uh, he didn't respond. It's almost as if he can't make it into the modern section of the house. I turned to the boy that was standing next to me, he was one of the students who lived in the house, and asked him who was standing in the doorway, and his only response to me was, oh, you see him too, and he explained that there was a ghost living in the house, that all of the occupants of the house had seen the ghost from time to time, and they had just become used to him being around. I think that's a very interesting haunting case. And what's especially interesting about it is that the ghost seems to be paying attention to the party. Something is happening that seems to be of interest to the ghost. This is a case where people are not afraid of a ghost. They know that other people have seen it, and it's not a traumatic situation. Other people might react differently and be just so upset by anything apparently paranormal that they would want to leave. Up until that time, I didn't believe at all in ghosts. I was very skeptical, and now I do believe. I was told that the house where this took place had been used as a field hospital during the battle, and that there had been a drummer boy who'd been wounded and taken to that location. None of it was scary. I was very surprised. It was just very sad, because he was so sad. In the summer of 1992, Hollywood came to town to film the major motion picture, Gettysburg. Whenever possible, the producers tried to stage scenes on the historic battleground in exactly the same places where the real action had taken place in 1863. They may have unintentionally disturbed the spirit world in the process. It appears that whenever the physical status quo of an area, the historic area, is upset, there seems to be a lot more psychic activity that occurs. In other words, it seems as if the spirits or the ghosts don't like their routine upset. After each day of filming, local people provided a shuttle service back into town for the thousands of reenactors who were participating in the battle scenes. One woman was offering the services of her pickup truck to take uh, some reenactors into, into the town of Gettysburg. And she dropped off a truckload of reenactors at one of the local restaurants and turned around and she began driving back home. It seems she had shuttled more off the battlefield than a bunch of movie reenactors. She uh, suddenly started to hear a tapping in the back of the truck. She looked in the rearview mirror and she saw something that completely frightened her. Two soldiers, two Civil War soldiers were sitting in the bed of the truck. Was someone playing a practical joke on her? Had some of the reenactors not gotten out of the back of her truck when she had stopped? Certainly no one had gotten in. She was uh, traveling way too fast uh, once she left the restaurant for anyone to have climbed or jumped into the, the back of the truck. Well, how could it be a ghost? 
but that does happen, that people have a haunting contaminate them, so to speak, and they end up with the ghost somewhere else, just as some people have moved out of a house and found that the ghosts have followed them. She pulled over suddenly, leapt out of the cab, went to the rear of the truck, and no one was in the back of the truck. And one can only speculate on who these weary, weary soldiers were. trying to uh, uh, catch a ride on a strange, uh, horseless conveyance. Whether playing with your mind or just being mischievous and silly, nearly every human activity has been attributed to ghosts. <laughs> Another historic place where ghosts seem to linger is the Gettysburg Park itself. One bizarre incident that happened at the park involved a group of visiting dignitaries. One of the very first stories that I heard about the battlefield, and that's been whispered about and talked about by the park rangers through the years, is a story about a group of visiting dignitaries who had been taken on a battlefield tour by the National Park Service. A special tour was arranged just for them. They visited the various sites and they got to a, a, one of the battle sites and got out of their car and they were about to observe and be explained uh, the battle action in that area. They looked down into the little valley and lo and behold there was a, a unit down there, a Civil War unit, dressed just like uh, they would have been at the time of the war. They began maneuvering, uh, marching, forward marching, doing the flank maneuvers, the column left, and uh, the, the wheeling. An evolution is what they call it, of a, of a regiment uh, in battle drill. And the dignitaries were very, very pleased that the National Park Service would put on this demonstration just for their benefit. What they may have seen was the park's phantom regiment. Over the years, numerous visitors have witnessed exactly the same scene. When they got back to the headquarters of the National Park, they thanked the uh, person that was in charge very, very much for that wonderful demonstration uh, of the uh, reenactment group that he had scheduled for them. Of course, the individual that was in charge of everything was nonplussed. He had scheduled no reenactors for the battlefield that day and knew of no battlefield reenactors that were at the site at that time. Of course, they all have to check in and make sure that they are certified so that they may, they may go out on the battlefield. The foreign dignitaries who saw this apparent reenactment on the battlefield thought it was real. They had no idea that it was an apparition until later. We have many people seeing the same thing, which means it's an evidential case. It's not just one person's hallucination. There have been some reenactment cases, if you want to call them that, in which the soldiers were not realistic looking. They were shadowy shapes. They may not have moved around. Collective apparitions, but not full like this one. There have been other observations like this on the battlefield, but this is, I think, the best one. Another tragic war story that may have given birth to a ghost involves General John Reynolds. Reynolds was considered by many to be one of the best and brightest officers in the Union Army. During the Battle of Gettysburg, though, the action he saw was short and deadly. He rode into battle leading his troops about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning of July 1st. By 10.20, he was dead, shot through the head by a Confederate sharpshooter. Reynolds became the highest ranking Union officer to die in the battle. Yet his presence has been felt in Gettysburg ever since the war. Perhaps his quick demise so early in the battle has been troubling him over the decades, for his spirit seems to haunt the town. One person he seems to have contacted is Carol Kirkpatrick. The incident happened during a tour of the battlefield, where she didn't know what to expect and had never heard of the general. 
No one knew where we were going on the battlefield, except for me. I just led them out to these places, and one of the places I wanted to take care of was to where General John F. Reynolds was shot and killed out of Reynolds Woods. We were driving along Confederate Avenue, and all of a sudden, she said, ouch, I have a terrible pain in my back. It's like all the hair started standing up on the back of my head. And then as we went on, it's like the pain started going down my side, my back, my lower back got the pain, then into my leg. I finally realized that she was talking about General Reynolds. Reynolds was shot in the back of the neck. And uh, of course, that would produce a terrible pain down your spine if that had happened. Soon, they stopped in the very area where Reynolds had been shot. Mark was careful not to tell her anything about the general. It was up to her to tell him. I'd like to get into the person, possibly what his last feelings, activities were, uh, what was going on at the moment he was struck, what was his last concept or factor of uh, happening. We were walking toward the spot where Reynolds was shot. And it was, it was almost like reading the account from uh, Reynolds' uh, staff member who was right on the spot. I feel that he was a very strong, outgoing individual, had a strong mind on ideas, factors, very calculating. She told me that Reynolds was feeling very, very powerful at the time. Uh, of course, he had just been offered the command of the entire Union Army, turned it down, instead was commanding the famous Union Army First Corps. Was he setting up high when this happened? He's on his horse. She said he turned, and she indicated the exact direction in which he turned, and she said, and then he was shot. Amazingly, then, Carol saw the death of the great general who had fallen over a century before. Something hit him, and I felt, had he had stayed where he was, it would have possibly hit him in another area. But he was, like, riding around, it appeared to me, or what shown to me, and as he rode and turned was when then he was struck. Carol, you almost uh, said it verbatim exactly what happened to Reynolds. I don't think Carol could have boned up on, on the battle. I've been studying it for 35 years, and I'm still learning things about it. Certainly she couldn't, in one evening, she couldn't have uh, learned everything uh, that uh, she told me today. So it's virtually impossible for her to have known anything that she wasn't told out on the battlefield. This trickster element in ghostly behavior may also be responsible for numerous unexplained equipment breakdowns on the Gettysburg battlefield. Countless people have had problems with uh, cameras out in the triangular field area. I myself and uh, two others, simultaneously our cameras broke down in that area. Other people have come up to me when I was out there giving tours and mentioned that all of a sudden their cameras have gone on the blink and uh, they won't function anymore. They tell me when they get out of the triangular field area that uh, the cameras are working fine again. I think one of the most fascinating questions about ghosts is why there are so many equipment failures. I've had it happen to me. Cameras fail and I can't remember anything like that happening except when I was doing something on the paranormal, especially ghosts. If there's some sort of psychic energy in a place that accounts for hauntings, then possibly that energy arrangement has something to do with equipment failures too. One incident actually happened during the filming of Mark Nesbitt at the Triangular Field several years ago by veteran television producer John Jones. Mark warned the producer ahead of time that he was asking for trouble by trying to shoot the story in this haunted place. I'm 
goes, no, no, no. He said, the ca your cameras won't function in this field. Well, that was a cute story. That's fine. But, um, you know, we're producers. We're in the real world. And, uh, yeah, my cameras will work. They were good cameras. It was new equipment. Uh, we had been shooting for a couple weeks up to this time. We asked Mark to step beyond the fence and we set up our camera. And I was talking to Mark while the crew was setting the camera. The camera was setting up the camera. And he yelled, uh, John, we've got a problem. And I, and I looked, and he says, I, I've got a warning light in my viewfinder. I had looked over the fence towards Mark, and he's standing there with this sort of this all-knowing smile and shaking his head. I told you so. We hadn't experienced problems with it prior to this, to this event. And we were shooting all morning until we arrived at the triangular field. But the moment we mounted that camera on the tripod and turned the switch on, um, until we left and lifted the camera off the tripod, we had all kinds of havoc. The camera worked fine the rest of the day. It's only at the triangular field that we have problems making any recordings. Not all cameras malfunction at the triangular field, but the high number of out-of-focus shots and equipment failures produced there remains a mystery. Gettysburg. The supernatural incidents that occur here might happen to anyone who ventures onto these hollowed grounds that were once soaked with the blood of thousands of young soldiers. Some ended their lives suddenly. Others lingered painfully until they gasped a final breath. Most died in unfamiliar surroundings, and many believe they still roam these fields trying to make peace. It has been said that when a violent death occurs, the spirit of the person goes into a nearby inanimate object such as a rock, a tree, or a building. Sachs Bridge is such a place. Built over Gettysburg's Marsh Creek in 1852, the covered bridge was deep in the Confederate rear when the Battle of Gettysburg began. Its timbers seemed to resonate with sounds, feelings and memories of the blood-soaked days of the Civil War. An innocent, cool breeze flowing through this latticework can easily cause a chill and awaken a sense of fear. There is an uncomfortable presence here that suggests that the bridge itself is alive, as if the bridge itself is breathing. Zach's Bridge was just one mile from Confederate General James Longstreet's headquarters, and his troops surely marched across it on July 1st as they prepared to attack the Union lines. Legend holds that three of these Confederate soldiers deserted their unit rather than risk defeat. They were captured and they were quickly punished. The penalty for desertion during the Battle of Gettysburg was death. That day, the deserters were taken back to the bridge they had fled over. Nooses were thrown over the rafters inside, and for one afternoon at Gettysburg, Sachs Bridge was a hanging place. There's a coal spot there today. If you can find that coal spot, apparently that's where these men were hung. Many people have reported this icy cold area on the bridge. People find their way to this pastoral setting as a place to remember part of this country's past. For others, this place truly becomes a bridge to the past. Tourists by the name of Beth visited the Sachs Mill Bridge. It was a very hot day and she felt an icy cold area became very distressed by this, uh, very upset, uh, disoriented. As she finished her crossing, 
The cold feeling disappeared and she looked back to see what could have caused it. It was then that she saw a most gruesome sight. As Beth looked on, she saw the execution of the three Confederate soldiers take place again almost 140 years after the men had been hanged here. It seems that the spirits of Confederate soldiers still linger here around Saks Bridge. While Beth had been unprepared for her supernatural encounter, there are others who come here looking for one. Some people are gifted with what is often called a sixth sense, the intuitive ability to perceive what most people cannot. Jan had come to Gettysburg hoping to test a feeling. She believes she is sensitive to supernatural forces and, with her husband Jim, plan to try her psychic abilities on the hallowed ground around Saks Bridge. As they imagined the executions that had taken place here and the horrid fighting that occurred nearby, Jan used her intuition to lead Jim through the locality in search of unusual feelings. While they walked, Jim videotaped their experiment. Almost immediately, Jan began to pick up strange sensations. As the couple walked through a grove of trees, Jan started to get feelings of sadness. As she continued, waves of coldness seemed to pass through her body. She described to Jim that there was something just up ahead and that he should follow her that way. Jan continued on her path as Jim kept up the taping. Each step of the way brought Jan deeper feelings of melancholy. Jim, on the other hand, felt none of the sensations that his wife was reporting and that he was documenting. They crossed a small stream and Jan thought that she could feel men dying all around her. She could hear young voices gasping for a last breath. For Jim, the experience was uncomfortable and as the path in front of them widened, Jan started pointing up ahead to a group of trees. Jim trained his camera toward what he thought might be his wife's vision. They heard whispers and the sound of a horse in the distance. As Jan stared, she reported seeing the faint outline of a horse followed by what she described as a group of men in uniform. As the Phantom Patrol approached, its outline became clearer to Jan. Throughout the experience, Jim saw nothing through his viewfinder, even though Jan insisted that she saw something in the trees up ahead. The videotape that Jim made that day is a startling record of his wife's ability to detect the presence of the supernatural. Upon playback, an image of six men and a horse could actually be seen approaching the position of the couple. There is no rational explanation for what happened in that videotape, or why the scene was only visible to Jan as her husband stood behind her holding the camera. For still others who visit Saks Bridge, a supernatural experience can take place so quickly and innocently that no one realizes it happened until after it has ended. For William, a longtime resident of Gettysburg, the experience he would share near Saks Bridge would be equally disturbing and unexplainable. William's pastime and hobby is photography and he seldom left home without his camera. The area around the Gettysburg battlefield continually offered that perfect shot and he was always prepared for it. He was taking pictures in the forest at the east end of Saks Bridge when a pair of tourists, Laura and Marlon, came climbing over the rocks to see what he was doing. The three began talking as William pointed out the direction of General Longstreet's Confederate headquarters and explained the number of troops who would have crossed here during the Battle of Gettysburg.
As William continued his description, the group noticed another person had joined them. He was dressed as a soldier with no shoes on, apparently a reenactor. William was impressed by the authenticity of the soldier's gray uniform and the period musket he carried, and he pointed out some of the details to the couple. William offered to photograph Marlon and Laura with the soldier, but he stared blankly ahead and said nothing as the couple smiled and posed with him for pictures. When the brief photo session ended, William and the couple resumed their conversation and without a word, the soldier wandered off. Within seconds, he was nowhere to be seen and William and the group assumed they had just lost sight of him. When the film was developed, the tourists posing near Saks Bridge could be seen, but none of the photos contained any trace of the mysterious Confederate soldier. Saks Bridge spans not only water, but time. To visit here is to come face to face with more than 100 years of history. A history that replays itself over and over again in haunted Gettysburg. Nora. Come here.
with the drummer. Do you see anything? and just go Wouldn't be the first ones who've heard drums here when there's no but no people here. But it's hard for me to believe I'm actually hearing it.
There are scores of men who fell on the battlefields here, and there are a myriad of strange sightings and occurrences that have been reported ever since. The hanging bridge conveys chills. The hotel is home to ghosts. A young woman eternally bakes bread for soldiers who have long ago vanished. A phantom patrol walks endlessly in the forest. These are but a few of the stories of the hauntings here, tales from the place called Haunted Gettysburg.